What can you say about the kind of formal structure, or the kind of formal foundation you can build such a formal structure on, about the kinds of things you would start on in order to build this kind of uh, deep computable knowledge trees? So the question is sort of how do you, how do you think about computation? And there's, there's a couple of points here. One is what computation intrinsically is like, and the other is what aspects of computation we humans with our minds and with the kinds of things we've learnt can sort of relate to in that computational universe. So if we start on the kind of what can computation be like, it's something I've spent some big chunk of my life studying, is imagine that you're, you know, we, we usually we write programs where we kind of know what we want the program to do, and we carefully write you know, many lines of code, and we hope that the program does what we, what we intended it to do. But the thing I've been interested in is if you just look at the kind of natural science of programs. So you just say, I'm going to make this program. It's a really tiny program. Maybe I even pick the pieces of the program at random, but it's really tiny. And by really tiny, I mean, you know, less than a line of code type thing. Mm -hmm. You say, what does this program do? And you run it. And big discovery that I made in the early 80s is that even extremely simple programs, when you run them, can do really complicated things really surprised me. It took me several years to kind of realize that that was a thing, so to speak. But that, that realization that even very simple programs can do incredibly complicated things that we very much don't expect, that discovery, I mean, I realized that that's very much, I think, how nature works. That is, nature has simple rules, but yet does all sorts of complicated things that we might not expect. You know, as a big thing of the last few years has been understanding that that's how the whole universe and physics works but that's a, a quite separate topic. But so there's this whole world of programs and what they do and very rich, sophisticated things that these programs can do. But when we look at many of these programs, we look at them and say, well, that's kind of, I don't really know what that's doing. It's not a very human kind of thing. So on the one hand, we have sort of what's possible in the computational universe. On the other hand, we have the kinds of things that we humans think about, the kinds of things that are developed in kind of our intellectual history. And that's uh, and the, the, really the challenge to sort of making things computational is to connect what's computationally possible out in the computational universe with the things that we humans sort of typically think about with our minds. Now, that's a complicated kind of moving target because the things that we think about change over time. We've learned more stuff. We've invented mathematics. We've invented various kinds of ideas and structures and so on. So it's, it's gradually expanding. We're kind of gradually colonizing more and more of this kind of intellectual space of possibilities. But the, the real thing, the real challenge is, how do you take what is computationally possible? How do you take, how do you encapsulate the kinds of things that we think about in a way that kind of plugs into what's computationally possible? And, and actually the the, uh, the big sort of idea there is this idea of kind of symbolic programming, symbolic representations of things. And so the, the question is, when you look at sort of everything in the world and you kind of, you know, you take some visual scene or something you're looking at, and you say, well, how do I turn that into something that I can kind of stuff into my mind? You know, there are lots of pixels in my visual scene, but the things that I remembered from that visual scene are you know, there's a, there's a chair in this place. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a symbolic representation of the visual scene. There are two chairs and a table or something, rather than there are all these pixels arranged in all these detailed ways. And so the question then is, how do you take sort of all the, all the things in the world and make some kind of representation that corresponds to the types of ways that we think about things? And, and human language is, is sort of one form of representation that we have. We talk about chairs, that's a word in human language and so on. How do we, how do we take, but human language is not in and of itself something from, that plugs in very well to sort of computation. It's not something from which you can immediately compute consequences and so on. And so you have to kind of find a way to take sort of the, the, the stuff we understand from human language and make it more precise and that's really this story of, of symbolic programming. And you know what, what that turns into is something which I didn't know at the time it was going to work as well as it has. But back in the 1979 or so, I was trying to build my first big computer system and trying to figure out you know, how should I represent computations at a high level. And I kind of invented this idea of using kind of symbolic expressions, you know, structured as it's kind of like a 
a function and a bunch of arguments, but that function doesn't necessarily evaluate to anything. It's just a, a thing that sits there representing a structure. And so building up that structure, and it's turned out that structure has been extremely, it's a, it's a good match for the way that we humans, it seems to be a good match for the way that we humans kind of conceptualize higher level things. And it's been for the last, I don't know, 45 years or something, it's served me remarkably well.